I guess. There's. Do we have any other guest speaker here? Not yet. Okay. Uh, ah. Yeah. Uh, la, la doctora Alcira Castillo. Uh, she's the guest speaker for for the plenary session of the School of Health Professions. Y junto a ella está la doctora Estela Estapé, decana de la Escuela de Profesiones de la Salud. Tenemos algunos decanos aquí, decanas. Eh, la doctora Wanda Maldonado, decana de la Escuela de Farmacia. Acompañada por la pasada decana, qué bonito se ve eso, la doctora Lesbia Hernández. Funcionarios que se retiran y vuelven a respaldar este tipo de actividad, y yo creo que eso es bien importante. Eh, el doctor Pedro Juan Santiago Borrero, que llegó esta mañana bien tempranito por ahí, de la Escuela de Medicina. El doctor José Cordero, eh, who is the host uh, for Dr. B. Foggy, de la Escuela de Salud Pública. La, la doctora Gloria Ortiz, decana asociada de la Escuela de Enfermería, está por ahí también porque la decana está fuera de Puerto Rico en un viaje. Eh, ¿Algún otro decano o decana que esté con nosotros? Eh, directores de unidades institucionales, señores y señoras, invitados especiales y funcionarios del presidente de la Universidad de Puerto Rico, tenemos la ayudante de prensa del presidente, también tenemos uno de nuestros auspiciadores, representante de Indunif, el señor Carlos Tolinchi, Tolinche, que colabora con nosotros en muchos comités, el director de la editorial de la Universidad de Puerto Rico, el doctor José Ortiz Valladares, está con nosotros por allá atrás. Y tendremos eh, los libros del editorial, principalmente de, de autores que, que son facultad nuestra o, o ex presidentes, etcétera, está con nosotros. Eh, va, van a tener una mesa con disponibilidad de inventario de, de libros. Y eh, entre nuestros profesores eméritos, el doctor Luis Ojo. Eh, Queridos compañeros del claustro, eh, profesores, eh, decanos asociados, demás eh, personas, eh, autoridades académicas a otros niveles, directores de departamento, investigadores, estudiantes, residentes y representantes de la prensa y miembros de la comunidad en general. Y a nuestros auspiciadores, este año, si se fijan en el programa, Tuvimos eh, cerca de 20 mil dólares en auspicios adicionales al foro. Quiero, no quiero que se pierda esta oportunidad y reconocer la labor del comité organizador que trabajó en, en conseguir, porque como saben, pues hace falta este auspicio para poder darles a ustedes un foro de la calidad que ustedes se merecen. No quiero tomar más tiempo porque sé que estamos un poco atrasados. Eh, como podrán ver en el, en el programa, vamos a, vamos a discurrir entre sesiones plenarias, sesiones concurrentes orales. Los afiches se van a estar dando hoy al mediodía y mañana al mediodía. Y la sesión de cierre será aquí a las once y media el viernes. Quiero hacer una aclaración importante en términos de logística. Este año no vamos a otorgar los premios a los estudiantes, las categorías han, han variado un poco, eh, al finalizar el foro. Lo, lo vamos a hacer la semana después de Semana Santa, el miércoles en la hora universal. Vamos a tener una actividad especial para otorgar los premios a los estudiantes, residentes y fellows que ganen en la competencia de carteles y de presentaciones orales. Eh, porque así hay tiempo suficiente para avisarles, para que todos puedan sacar es una hora de almuerzo para que todos puedan estar aquí y compartir eh, 
un momento especial y unos entre meses. Así es que quiero, eh, dicho esto, voy a proceder a presentar a nuestra al, nuestro querido presidente de la Universidad de Puerto Rico, el doctor Miguel Amuñoz Muñoz, quien nos ofrecerá un saludo y un mensaje para esta ocasión. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a great honor to be here this morning for the 32nd Annual Forum of Research and Education of the Medical Science. It's really a great pleasure. Uh, I want to, to greet uh, the Chancellor, Rafael Rodriguez, our guest speakers, the deans, professors, students. And now I am going to speak in Spanish. Muy buenos días, damas y caballeros, amigos todos, señor rector, nuestros conferenciantes, profesores, estudiantes. Es para mí un gran placer dirigirme a ustedes en el 32 segundo Foro Anual de Investigación y Educación del Recinto de Ciencias Médicas de la Universidad de Puerto Rico, en el cual se expondrán los trabajos investigativos que se llevan a cabo en ciencias básicas, ciencias, ciencias aplicadas, epidemiología, ciencias clínicas, casos clínicos y educación. La Universidad de Puerto Rico, mediante su compromiso de servicio al pueblo, tiene como misión transmitir e incrementar el saber por medio de las ciencias y de las artes. Y este importante foro es un ejemplo fidedigno de que nuestra universidad cumple a cabalidad con su misión. Y precisamente el tema en que se centralizarán sus discusiones en los próximos tres días, determinantes sociales de la salud, un reto para todos, permitirá comprobar la gesta investigativa, educativa y clínica de la institución a través de nuestro prestigioso recinto de ciencias médicas y de sus actividades diferentes en las escuelas de salud y ciencias especializadas. Esta actividad corrobora que la investigación es un eje primordial dentro de toda institución de educación superior que valore su prestigio y atesore su crecimiento. Y con frecuencia me habrán escuchado decir que lo que le da el margen siempre adicional a una institución universitaria es la investigación. Cuando vemos los programas académicos, vemos mucha similaridad entre una institución y otra en los diferentes campos, en lo que son los cursos, nuestros programas que tenemos. Pero lo que abre los horizontes de crecimiento, que nos hace ir mucho más allá, es la investigación. Ese deseo que tenemos de conocer, de aprender, de solucionar los problemas, de intercambiar ideas, de intercambiar conocimiento. Por ello... Este foro se convierte en el escenario perfecto para compartir ese nuevo conocimiento y estrechar lazos de colaboración en esa labor de investigación de la academia que involucra tanto a los facultativos como a los estudiantes. Los más de 250 profesores y estudiantes que aquí convergen tendrán la oportunidad única de exponer sus ideas sobre los retos que supone la salud del siglo XXI para todos los profesionales en esa área. Deseo también, también dar una calurosa bienvenida a los invitados que nos acompañan durante este foro y que durante estos días se darán cita en este prestigioso evento, pero muy especial a los estudiantes, quienes representan el futuro de nuestra institución y el frente de avanzada en la investigación en salud. Les exhorto a que participen de todas las actividades incluidas en la agenda del foro, para así obtener el máximo provecho de esta experiencia. Además, felicito a la facultad y a la administración de nuestro recinto de ciencias médicas por sus gestiones en continuar con esta importante iniciativa. Y cuando miro lo variado del programa y veo cómo integramos el componente de salud con el ambiente, 
cómo integramos la salud física y mental de nuestro pueblo, me hace sentirme sumamente orgulloso, porque creo firmemente que esta institución marca el, pa marca el paso en la investigación y en buscar las soluciones para los problemas de salud que aquejan a nuestro pueblo y a muchas otras sociedades del mundo entero. Les deseo el mayor de los éxitos, que Dios me los bendiga y que tengan un foro bien productivo. Muchas gracias. En estos momentos quiero llamar a el vicepresidente de Investigación y Tecnología, el doctor José Lazalde, quien ha sacado un poquito desocupado tiempo y nos honra con su presencia hoy. Good morning to all. Uh, on behalf of the Vice President of Research and Technology Office of the University of Puerto Rico, I will welcome you all to the 32nd Annual Research and Education Forum of the Medical Science Campus entitled Social Determinants of Health, Everybody's Challenge. It's really a pleasure to have you all here today, especially invited speakers, faculty, and students. This morning I went through the abstract and I found my, you know, brief reading that there are 169 poster presentations and about 16 conference sections. As the president mentioned, there is a wide range of topics in this program, from basic research findings to clinical research, including a lot of community-based research. I read topics such as personality traits and emotional dysregulation, curriculum for pediatric night float rotation, juntas somos fuertes, a way to cure breast cancer, emerging microbial threats, cognitive impairment in patients with traumatic brain injury, out of hospital cardiac effect management evaluation and many others. All of these presentations provide an overwhelming evidence of the richness and quality of the research and education programs that are going at the medical science campus. And I must say that I'm very proud of the organizing committee of this meeting and I would like to congratulate them The medical science campus is in the right track. The scientific atmosphere here represents to me the most important UPR asset as must be a top priority for this institution. From the abstracts, I have seen clinicians, scientists, mathematicians, social scientists, epidemiologists, and basic research from several campuses of the UPR system, private institutions in Puerto Rico, and from the mainland working together in many of these presentations. This collective effort is a clear indication that the medical science campus is moving towards a translational research pathway at high speed. However, we must also recognize that this is a, an extraordinarily difficult time for all of us in the fields of research and education. President Obama, Chief of Staff, in a recent meeting, uh, Ram Emanuel, said, you should never waste a good crisis. In research and education, through these difficult budget times, Many institutions are promoting reforms. We have the opportunity, or I shall say the ch challenge, to completely reform UPR research agenda. As we all know, minority programs from NIH and NSF are being dramatically reduced and reorganized. More than 50% of the UPR research funds in the past decade came from this minority research program. And we all know that 
competitive grant such as R01 are in the A to 11 funding range. We're not talking about fixing the edge in this system. We are talking about a fundamental rethinking of how UPR's research enterprise, including graduate school program, will function within the next 20 years. So we must place special attention on our research and training programs like never before. UPR Research Enterprise is facing a big challenge. UPR must evolve towards an academic environment that prioritizes technology transfer and innovation. We must promote a new emphasis on licensing UPR's intellectual property. UPR ability to advance basic discoveries into innovation is critical and requires translational resources. Along this line, the UPR has launched several initiatives. The Office of the Vice President of Research and Technology under the direction of Dr. Walter Silva will launch the first UPR handbook for policies of intellectual property licensing and commercialization. Another initiative is the creation of the Technology Transfer and Innovation Office that will be located at the Molecular Science Building, and most of you will be there for a cocktail tomorrow. The Technology Transfer and Innovation Office will connect UPR research to pharma and provi provide the translational tools, tools such as infrastructure, incubators, SBIR, space grants, workshops, and others. The Office of the Vice President of Research is working on a plan to create UPR's innovation ecosystem. During recent discussions with the, and I should highlight this because this is very important. During recent discussions with the Puerto Rico Industrial Development Company, we know locally as PRITCO and the Science Trust, it has become evident that Puerto Rico's innovation based economical develop development should focus more on UPR academic research environment. I will summarize by saying that we must look into an innovative vision of Puerto Rico's economical and social future through the transforming powers of research and innovation and also education. But it's very important for us today to recognize that the University of Puerto Rico will be a key player in this transformation. Once again, I welcome you all. Have a very uh, uh, successful meeting and uh, enjoy Puerto Rico for all the visitors. Thank you so much. Now I will ask the Chancellor of the Medical Sciences Campus, Dr. Rafael Rodriguez Mercado, to please come to the podium. Well, good morning to all. I'm going to try to be short, okay? Short message. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a great honor uh, to welcome the, you and uh, to the 32nd Annual uh, Research Education Forum of the University of Puerto Rico Medical Science Campus. I am very glad that uh, all our uh, honored guests accept this invitation uh, to join us in this important forum uh, of the Medical Science Campus. Uh, I remember, I'm going to say two things, uh, only two things. I remember when I was doing my fellowship in Buffalo uh, that my mentor, Dr. Nick Hopkins, told me, Raphael, you can be the best professional in your country. But if you don't publish, if you don't do research, if you, if you don't let people around the world that you assist, you are a mediocre. You are a mediocre. Because all of the knowledge that you know, that you have, all of the experience that you have, you keep it for yourself and not let the world know. 
that is the most important thing that motivates me uh, in order to continue to do research and how important is the research for this institution. Here in the medical science campus, more than 60% of the budget of this institution come from indirect costs from research, most of them from research. So that is the importance that we have to think in our minds that uh, this forum has to be because here we are uh, looking the future scientific uh, uh, society of Puerto Rico in terms of health uh, science. This is a very important thing. Also, it's very important to know that uh, as health professionals, we are here to serve people. The day that we cannot serve people, we, we must, uh, we better step down and go to our home and retire. Uh, that is the most important thing that you have to, to, to have in your minds. Uh, I am very glad uh, that uh, all of you are here. I hope that uh, during these uh, uh, three days of your uh, of the forum, you get the, a lot of uh, uh, scientific information that help not only to help uh, uh, to evaluate posters and our presentation, that they give, you get new ideas to develop new research, to develop new endeavors, and not only with the people of Puerto Rico, only uh, also with the people around the world. It's very important. We have a lot of good people here, a lot of uh, good uh, investigators, people that are involved in research that are well known, that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. And uh, I am very proud uh, to be the chancellor of this institution. For me, the best institution of, of uh, health science in Puerto Rico and in many other states. Our faculty, our students have been uh, known all around the world for, this, for their work. And, and believe me, uh, we, we, people know about us. People know about us and I hope that uh, that uh, you uh, become motivated to continue to doing uh, this excellent job that you are doing. So God bless all you all. Thank you. And now we are going to start uh, the second section of this uh, plenary uh, session, and I'm going to call Dr. Jose Carrion Baralt, who will be the moderator for the uh, Dr. Bill Foggy's uh, lecture. Pues buenos días a todas y a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a la eh, primera sesión plenaria de eh, este foro. Eh, ya nos estamos acercando a la sesión plenaria, así que eh, un momentito, por favor. Eh, welcome to all of you to our first plenary session in this uh, forum. It's a pleasure and privilege to have uh, Dr. William Feggy uh, with us. Uh, the talk that he will offer this morning uh, is entitled uh, Public Health and Destiny. Uh, I'm not going to take any more time, but I would like to point out a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Feg is not going to be using any slides, so if you want to take notes, please get uh, paper and pencil ready. And secondly, please hold all the questions till the end. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Cordero, the Dean of our School of Public Health, is going to introduce uh, Dr. Feg. Thank you. Buenos días. Eh, es un honor y un placer estar aquí uh, en este eh, foro de investigación de reciente de ciencias médicas. Y sobre todo es un placer este y un honor poder presentarle al doctor uh, William Feggy. Um, eh, eh, voy a hacer este la, la descripción de, de su currículum en inglés de manera que sepa lo que estamos diciendo. Um, 
Dr. Feggy is an epidemiologist who worked in the successful campaign to eradicate smallpox in the 1970s. Uh, he became chief of the CDC's smallpox eradication program and was appointed director of CDC Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 1977. Um, he attended Pacific Lutheran University and received his medical degree from the University of Washington and his master's in public health from Harvard University. In 1984, Dr. Feggy and several colleagues formed the task force Task Force for Child Survival, a working group for the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the World Bank, the United Nations Development Program, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, its success in accelerating childhood immunization led to the expansion of its mandate to 1991, in 19, 1991 to include other issues which diminish the quality of life for children, including social determinants of health. Uh, Dr. Feggy joined uh, the Carter Center in 1986 as Executive Director and Fellow for Health Policy and the Executive Director of Global 2000. In 1992, res he resigned as Executive Director of the Carter Center but continued to serve as Fellow and also as Executive Director of the Task Force for Child Survival and Development. And in 97, he was uh, uh, appointed Presidential Distinguished Professor of International Health in the Rollins Schools of Public Health. And uh, in 1999, uh, Dr. Feggy became a Senior Medical Advisor for Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, as an advisor to the foundation, Dr. Feggy had a tremendous influence in the development of programs that address health issues and poverty. Uh, he retired from Emory University in 2001 but he remains uh, very active as Emeritus Professor of International Health. And actually, he was just telling me last night that he still goes to the office like almost every day um, when he's in Atlanta. Um, uh, Dr. Feggy has championed many issues from child survival and development, injury prevention, population, preventive medicine, and public health leadership as special interest, particularly in the developing world. He is well known a strong proponent of disease eradication and control, and has taken an, an, an active role in the eradication of guinea worm, polio, measles, and eradication of river blindness. Not as well known is his fervent effort to address poverty and social, uh, social justice as a public health challenge. An example is his, <coughs> excuse me, his active participation in the World Health, or, uh, World health Organization Commission landmark uh, report on social determinants of health that was released in, in 2010. Introduction of these reports makes two points that are very well resonate with Dr. Feggy's advocacy in bringing social determinants to the forefront as a public health issue of this century. In the report states, and I quote, social justice is a matter of life and death. It affects the way that people live, their their consequent chance of illness and the risk of premature death. And the report also uh, states, and I quote, social and economic policies that uh, have a determining impact on whether a child can grow and develop to its full potential and live a flourishing life or whether its life will be blighted. Uh, by writing and in lecturing extensively, Dr. Feige has succeeded in broadening public awareness of these issues I'm bringing them to the forefront of domestic and international health uh, policies. Dr. Feggy is the recipient of many awards, holds honorary degrees from numerous organizations, and was named a fellow of the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in 1997. And he's the author of more than 125 professional publications. It is an honor and a pleasure uh, to introduce to you Dr. Bill Feggy. either bend over to the microphone or bring it up to me. <laughs> Thank you for the nice introduction, for the nice reception that I've had here. Some of you know that 30, over 30 years ago, 
that Dr. Cordero, while working at CDC, was able to do work on infant foods that resulted in a law that now protects infants, what is put into the food. So the entire country and the entire world now benefits from the work that he did. And I felt the need to say thank you to him at his own institution as sort of an individual mandate, if you will. My wife and I have a 13-year-old grandson who has both a serious side and a humorous side. On the humorous side, his emails now have a tagline that says, I wish for a future when a chicken can cross the road without having its motives questioned. <laughs> On the serious side, at age seven, sitting in the back seat of the car, he suddenly asked, what's the most important thing people could do to make the world better? Now that is a great question for every meeting that we have and for every day. What could we do to make the world better? Right now, the Supreme Court is looking at health care in the United States, as you well know. Those of us in health are very concerned by what has happened in our country. Because at one time, we did have the best health care system. Now politicians stand up and they say, we have the best health care delivery system in the world. And those of us in health know that is not true. We don't have the fifth best. We don't have the tenth best. If you use longevity as the marker, we're 38th best. And this has become a real concern to all of us. What has happened? Well, what has happened is we confuse destiny and bad management. It didn't have to be this way. First of all, when I was over 50 years ago getting interested in this, already out of medical school, there was something called the King Anderson Bill that none of you will even remember, but it was the beginning of legislation on what would happen with health care for older people in the United States. The American Medical Association would send out information to doctors saying, do not allow socialized medicine to take over. And in those days, I actually listened to authority. And I believed what they were saying. And I tried to figure out what was happening. And what was happening was they were so worried about socialized medicine that they did not see capitalism coming from the other direction. And they didn't realize capitalism was going to be worse than socialism. Because when profit is the bottom line, it is very hard to keep quality as the bottom line. The marketplace simply isn't the place to take care of everything. We only have to look at tobacco to know how the marketplace takes care of that. And if I told you 25 years from now, we will have a problem that will cause twice as many deaths in the world as the worst problem right now. And we could change that, but it would get some people upset in the marketplace. You would immediately say, we have to do that. Well, I can tell you, 25 years from now, there will be twice as many deaths from tobacco as today. And tobacco is the single most lethal agent in the world today. When I was getting into global health, the measles virus was the most lethal agent. It caused about three to four million deaths a year. With immunization programs, that figure has gone down dramatically, but now tobacco is up to five million deaths per year. It will go to 10 million before it finally plateaus. And yet we have this absolute worship of the marketplace to take care of our problems. Ron Paul, in fact, has said government should not be involved in H1N1 flu. He says influenza is so complicated, only the marketplace can handle this. Now, he says this four years after the marketplace destroyed the mortgages for homes, 
took away much of the retirement that people had set aside. Ruined education, took away hope, and we found out the marketplace can't even take care of the marketplace. And yet people continue to say we should use the marketplace for medicine. And now the vaunted marketplace has taken us to the most expensive health care system in the world, and yet we don't have the best results. And it's calculated that about a third of the money is in fact not going to the improvement of health. It's going to many other things. How do we change all of this? What is the solution? Well, one solution, of course, would be a single-payer system, but it's not likely that politicians are going to go for that. But another solution is that we figure out how to measure health outcomes and actually reimburse programs for health outcomes rather than health process. If we can do that, then the marketplace could, in fact, change what happens. But we have other problems. One is, a second one is our attitude towards prevention. We all talk about it. The rhetoric is very good, but it's not where we put our money. And it's very difficult to get money for prevention. And in the United States, we oftentimes will not financially reward a practitioner who spends time on prevention with their patients. And so we continue to hear as we go through school, do no harm. And then we find out that that actually has a caveat. Do no harm unless money is involved. And if money is involved, you do not have to provide prevention for your patient. We do this at federal, state, local, and individual levels. We're all guilty of this. We do not invest in prevention for ourselves until something goes wrong. And one of the worst days in medicine is the day that you have to tell someone that they have lung cancer. That day, I can tell you they would give all of their money, no matter how much, and I have actually seen this happen now with a billionaire, they would give away all of their money if they could step back 20 years and change what they do. But a week before, they were not able to change what they were doing. And so we're all guilty of this, and we have to change what we actually reward. A third problem is how we fund health. My last appropriations hearing as director of CDC was a landmark for me because the person presiding was Senator Mark Hatfield from Oregon, a very good person. And he asked me the question, okay, how would you fund public health and prevention? It's the kind of question you always hope for, but you're not prepared for because you know you'll never hear it. And so it took me by surprise. But here's what I said. There are some programs where we have a positive benefit cost ratio. That is, for every dollar we invest, we not only correct the health problem, but we get more than a dollar in return. So it would not make any sense not to fund those programs because we would still have the health problem and we would lose money. So I said, whenever we have a program with a positive benefit health ratio, we should make that an entitlement and it no longer competes with the rest of the budget. There aren't many programs like that, but immunization falls into that category. Second, I suggested that for public health and prevention, we should index the amount of money going into that area to the full medical uh, costs because we know medical expenditures will continue to increase. And I said, I'm willing to take whatever the ratio is today and say we will index it for the future, that whatever the medical expenditures are, we'll take that percentage for public health and prevention. The third thing would be to figure out how to measure health outcomes. Now, we can't do this for every patient, so we would continue to reward the insurance companies the way we do now. But we would also add a, 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 an extra reward for improvements in health outcomes. And this could be per million patient days or some other uh, denominator. But when people would find out in the insurance companies 
that they could make extra money by improving health outcomes, they would start recruiting sick people into the insurance programs rather than well people. They would incorporate smoke enders and diet programs and exercise programs and injury control programs and diabetes control and hypertension control, all of the things that we would like to see in prevention, these would be incorporated into the program and we would see prevention as part of health care delivery. And finally, I said, we would figure out as a culture how to ration the health care. We do it now on the basis of if you're too poor, you don't get health insurance. That's not the right way to do this. So we're already rationing, and these people that say you can't do that don't realize we're already doing it. So those four things, change as entitlement, things that have a positive benefit cost ratio, that we would change, index prevention and, and uh, public health to total medical expenditures. We would figure out how to reward health outcomes and we would figure out how to ration in a rational way. But there are other things. We tolerate anti-science. Parents have so many things to worry about. They should not have to worry about autism being caused by immunizations. And when we talk to parents who do not want immunization, it's the first thing that comes up. They worry about autism, and we understand that. But the autism debate began when a man by the name of Andrew Wakefield published a paper saying that he thought autism was the result of using measles, mumps, rubella vaccine in one injection. It turns out now, many years later, and after millions of dollars have been spent in order to disprove this, it turns out that he was actually getting money from a lawyer who was suing a vaccine company. And yet, you think of the agony that this has caused parents. So anti-science, we, we just need to address that. And we need to address not delivering what we already know. This do no harm that we heard about so often in school was always in the context of errors of commission. The Institute of Medicine put out an entire book on do no harm and its errors of commission. People did not talk about errors of omission. And it's my contention that we kill far more people by the things we don't do, the science that's not shared, the vaccines that are not given. And we should be looking at what we actually deliver. Some of you who are as old as I am, and uh, having said that, I realize there's no one in this audience as old as I am. Uh, but some of you will remember a writer by the name of James Thurber, who was a humorist and he wrote for The New Yorker. In 1994, The New York Times had an article for the centennial of his birth. And one of the stories in the article was James Thurber going to a reception. A woman came up, identified herself as an American living in Paris, and she said, they now translate your articles into French. And she said, they're even funnier in French than in English. He thought about that for a moment, and he said, yes, they tend to lose something in the original. That's the story with science. It loses something in the original. It has to be interpreted. The point you're making about it, you can have all of this knowledge, and if you're not sharing it, you are not actually using it. But then the last thing that I want to mention is ignoring the social determinants. That's really why I am here. The social determinants of health. Two of us once wrote a paper on the actual causes of death in the United States. The death certificates are put in terms of cancer or heart disease or other things. But if you look behind those, what are the actual causes of death? And it turns out that 40% of all deaths in the United States are caused by three things, tobacco and diet and alcohol. 
you add injury to that or violence to that, and you have four things that become very major. All of these are within control. They're not something that actually just happens to us. They're something that we can do something about. But now I keep thinking I should write another paper on the actual causes behind the actual causes. Because then you get into the social determinants. And there is no determinant quite as powerful as poverty. Study after study and culture after culture shows as income goes down, ill health goes up. And it's not just the difference between the rich and the poor. It's every gradation of reduction in income causes more and more ill health. So it's dose-related. It means poverty is dose-related to health. We know in public health how to deal with dose-related things, whether it's cholesterol or blood pressure. But sometime, somehow we have not adopted poverty as one of the things that we should be dealing with in public health. Why don't we? Well, it's not been part of the tradition. But there's something more than this. We don't want to deal with poverty because every person in this room benefits from poverty. We get our food cheaper, our clothes cheaper, our hotel rooms cheaper because there are people working at minimum wage or below. And the same thing, we're getting things from other countries because of people working at starvation wages, which means poor people actually subsidize us. And this should make us very embarrassed. And I think back to how hard it was in the southern part of the United States to deal with slavery because the white population was actually benefiting. And why would they want to change this? In 1842, Bishop Longstreet, president of Emory, joined 11 other clergymen to write an opinion that slavery was not a moral issue and that bishops could have slaves. And so we're some way in that same situation with poverty. We all benefit and we don't want to deal with it as a moral issue. Two days ago in the New York Times, I read an article that so shocked me that it continues to shock me every time I think about it. In the United States in 2010, the average income of the bottom 99%, which has to be all of us, the average income went up $80 for that year. The average income for people in the top 1% increased over $1 million per person. Now, this is, is a figure I cannot quite get my hands around, but it shows you the gap between rich and poor haves and have-nots and how that gap is actually increasing. Poverty is slavery, and we have noticed that recognized it for a long time, but we haven't dealt with it. Over the years, I've been collecting quotes about poverty. Not going to give you all of them, but let me share a few of them. One comes from the Old Testament, Amos the prophet, who is sent to warn people in the uh, northern kingdom that they must do something to decrease the gap between the rich and the poor. Moism, which preceded Confucius, talks about the rich hurting the poor. Wang Si in China 600 years ago said, we must deal with poverty as if the person is drowning. There is no time to lose. We must act immediately. William Penn said, poverty is a reproach to religion and the government. Lyndon B. Johnson the wall between rich and poor is a wall of glass to which everyone can see. Robin Wright, the meek show no sign of inheriting the earth. Plato, any ordinary city is in fact two cities, one the city of the poor, the other of the rich, each at war with each other. 
Martin Luther King, the curse of poverty has no justification in our age. It is socially as cruel and blind as the practice of cannibalism at the dawn of civilization. Aristotle, poverty is the parent of revolution. Walter Cronkite, the real threat to democracy, is the half of the nation in poverty. And Michael Harrington, people who are much too sensitive to demand of cripples that they run races ask of the poor that they get up and act just like everyone else. There is an African proverb that goes right to the beginning of this, which says, poverty is slavery. And finally, Michael Manley, who said, poverty shared can be endured. But in the age of communication that we now have, poverty is not shared, and it's clear to everybody that it's not shared. What we really need is a William Wilberforce for poverty. William Wilberforce, you will recall in England, introduced a bill every year to outlaw the slave trade. And every year he lost. And I can't quite remember, but I think he did this for 30 or 35 years in a row, each year losing. But he wouldn't quit. He kept doing this. And then when his friend William uh, Pitt uh, died, a new prime minister came in and made the suggestion you might be doing this backwards because each year he would introduce it to the House of Commons, they would pass it, he would go to the House of Lords, and they would vote it down. And the new prime minister said it may be that the House of Lords simply doesn't like to be told by the House of Commons what they should be doing. Why don't you reverse the process? And so he did. He introduced it to the to the uh, Lords first. And the House of Lords actually passed it. Now he started worrying, will the House of Commons say, we're not going to let them tell us what to do? <laughs> and so he worried, and it was introduced, and it, the debate started in the evening. No one knew how long this was going to go on. But they had an orator, a young man. It was his first year in the House of Commons. And he got up and he gave a talk that was so compelling that pretty soon people were standing up, calling for the question. And so they took a vote and it won. They passed. They went off to celebrate. And William Wilberforce, instead of celebrating, asked, what should we do next? What should we do next? We need a William Wilberforce for poverty that makes this so real that it has to be passed. You cannot ignore it. But that's not the only social determinant of health. Education. Studies in Africa show that for every year of education in a woman, you have a reduction in infant mortality rates for their children. What a false economy not to allow people the education that they can accept. It's a public health concern. Public health people have to look at education the same as they look at poverty. This is a public health issue. Emmy Ademola was a classmate of mine in, for the Master's of Public Health degree. He was from Nigeria. And in our yearbook, he wrote, No area of knowledge is beyond the concern of public health practitioners. Over 40 years ago, he saw this. But then we also have gender bias. When my mother was born in the United States, women could not vote. She was a teenager when the United States finally decided that all men and all women were created equal. And so women got the vote. But you see, there are still places where gender bias is a real problem when it comes to employment, when it comes to getting the same salary. And in some church circles, they will not allow women to be ministers. We have enough problems in public health, and I can tell you from experience the dangers of involvement in church politics, and yet we have to condemn gender bias wherever we see it. And then there's fatalism. 
A third of all Americans are fatalistic in the sense that they do not think they can change their future. People in that category, you can understand why it is so hard to get them to stop smoking. They don't actually believe inside that they can change their future. In some countries, that figure is as high as 80%. And can you imagine trying to change a society where 80% of people simply feel they can't do anything about their future? Now, I always tell students to be careful of these figures because we all feel fatalistic at times, that the situation changes day by day. And I say I feel most fatalistic when I get in a taxi. I feel like I've simply lost control. But I was getting into a taxi one night in Philadelphia, going from the airport downtown, and it's not that far, when suddenly I realized I was smelling alcohol. And so I engaged the driver in conversation, trying to figure out how impaired the driver might be. And I said to the driver, you should know that I'm a high-risk passenger. And the driver asked, what does that mean? And I said, well, I've been in five taxi accidents in my life, and that's the truth. And the driver said, oh, that's nothing. I've been in a lot more than that. <laughs> so what is the summary of all of this? I can tell you that the tools and the resources and the interest in public health and global health will continue to increase. And when I go around to campuses now and see the interest in students who actually want to get into this field, who have a burning desire to change what happens in society, it is really very encouraging. Even corporations are changing their approach to global health and to public health. When Wyeth developed the bifurcated needle for smallpox vaccinations, this was quite a breakthrough because it allowed us to standardize a vaccination. You could train a person in 10 minutes or five minutes and they could get 95% repro reproducibility as they went from person to person. What did Wyeth do? They gave that patent to WHO. So it was one of the first signs of philanthropy from a corporation. But then Merck, in the 1980s, developed this wonderful drug for heartworm in dogs called Mectazan. Up until that time, you had to give your dog something every day to prevent heartworm. Then with HeartGuard, you only had to give it once a month. And when you buy HeartGuard, there's a heart in the package. You put that on your calendar and you know when to give the drug. But there was a man at Merck by the name of Mohammed Aziz who began wondering if this could not protect humans against onchocerciasis. And he went to the head of research at Merck, a man by the name of Roy Vagelos, and asked for money to go to Africa to test this in humans. They sat down and calculated that Merck would not be able to get its money back. But Roy Vangelos gave him the money anyway. He went to Africa. He found that this drug was so good. You give it once a month in dogs for heartworm, you only had to give it once a year to humans to prevent blindness from river blindness. So now Merck had a drug that was cheap. It would go to the poorest people in the world. They could not make a profit. They attempted to give this drug to the World Health Organization and they finally walked away in frustration. They attempted to give it to USAID, and USAID just said they weren't interested. And they came to Atlanta, and they made the same offer. If we give the drug free, will you figure out a way to deliver it? And our first question was, how long will you give it free? And they had to think about this because they said, we don't know what else the drug might be good for. But for onchocerciasis in humans, we will give it away free forever. They have now given 800 million treatments of Mectazan for river blindness in Africa, all free. Then, I used to chair the Mectazan Expert Committee, and I was chairing a meeting in France one Thursday afternoon, 
And a man by the name of Eric Otteson from WHO gave a talk on research at WHO. And someone had discovered by using mectazan and albendazole, they could have good results with lymphatic filariasis. Either drug alone does nothing. Put the two drugs together and it does something positive. And I kept asking the question, why would anyone take two drugs that don't work and put them together? And I still don't understand that, to tell you the truth. But now we suddenly had something that could be used in lymphatic filariasis. And the question was, who makes albendazole? The answer, Smith, Klein, Beecham. This is before they merged with Glaxo. Does anyone know anyone in the company high enough up to give us free drugs so that we could use it with lymphatic filariasis? We didn't. But we went to dinner very excited about a new possibility in global health. The next morning, I'm still chairing the session. It's Friday morning, 10 o'clock. Someone puts a piece of paper in front of me saying, President Carter is on the phone. Will you take the call? So I don't have to tell you the answer to that. He said, it's 5 o'clock in the morning in Atlanta, but he said, I'm so excited I had to talk to you. Does the name Jan Leshley mean anything to you? And I said it didn't. And he said, well, he's the CEO of a company called Smith Klein Beecham, and I had dinner with him last night, and he said he was so impressed with what Merck had done giving away Mectazan because he recognized what it did was provided loyalty in his staff. People like to work for a company that does the right thing. And his question to President Carter, do you know of anything Smith Klein Beecham could do that would be similar? I mean, talk about serendipity. By that afternoon, he had called Jan Leshley back and we had a commitment for albendazole. My whole point is, Everything is improving so fast, the tools and the resources and the people who are interested in this. This is the time to be a student in public health and in global health because we now see the field whole. And someone has said that the definition of genius is the ability to see one's field whole. Well, in public health, we are beginning to see the field whole. And I just envy the young people in the audience who are the students who will tomorrow make a difference, who will get up every morning knowing that they're writing history, they're actually writing a new destiny, that they're actually changing history before the fact. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have time for questions, so uh, if you could please raise your hands and uh, have any questions for uh, Dr. Feige, he'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. It, and you're absolutely right that everything is balancing the good and the bad. That if everything was good, it would be very easy to see the path ahead. It's trying to balance the things that go wrong with the things that go right and to change that balance. And no students have ever had more power to do that than the students now. So thank you very much.
Someday when you write the history of dengue, you will be able to answer that question, won't you? Uh, first, let me s tell you where I got that saying, we shouldn't confuse destiny with bad management. It was graffiti on the New York subway where someone had written that. Now, isn't that something? I mean, it, it's a profound statement. And you get it from graffiti on the subway. Well, the question of examples, we have so many now, one of them being smallpox eradication. Uh, the last century, it's estimated that 300 million people died of smallpox. And if you can imagine what that meant in terms of individual families, individual people, what it meant for countries to be dealing with smallpox. Uh, during the Revolutionary War, the United States did not give variolation while Britain did. The Battle of Quebec, the United States outnumbered the British two to one, but they had a smallpox outbreak and lost the Battle of Quebec. And so it's possible that Canada is not part of the United States because of, of smallpox. And, and so they see the balance sheet a little different of what's good and bad. Uh, but then George Washington decided to variolate the U.S. troops. And he was worried about doing that because if the word got out to the British, they would attack when the American troops were now suffering from the variolation. But he successfully did that, and it may have been the most important tactical decision that he made uh, during the Revolutionary War. But now when you think of going to India and you cannot find anyone under the age of 35 with smallpox pockmarks on their face, it's changed an entire society because it used to be if you didn't die from smallpox, there was a good chance you would have pockmarks. This changed the ability to marry. It, it followed people. This wasn't a two-week disease. This was a disease of a lifetime if you recovered, and that's all changed. When you look at measles, which I said was the single most lethal agent three decades ago, there are now, every year, three million new parents that get the chance to sit down at dinner with children that would not have been there if not for measles vaccine. This is good management. I recently went to the Measles Initiative 10-year review in Washington, and they said they have now, in the last 10 years, vaccinated a billion children with measles. I mean, a billion children. And I said, I can't actually see that number in my head. I, I don't know what that is. But I do know it means for all of our failings, for all of the things we do wrong, a billion times everything went right. From the production of that vaccine to the packaging to the shipping to getting the children to getting the vaccine in a child, a billion times everything went right. And we don't make anything out of that. That's, we accept that now. So over and over, we're seeing that people have a different way of living because of things they did, do not have to worry about. And, you know, the interesting thing is none of us think about that. I don't think about who do I have to thank for not having smallpox myself. Uh, but we do think of when something happens that's positive. When I was uh, in the 1940s, I had septicemia and penicillin had just come out. And the doctor told my parents uh, two years ago we could not have saved it, and now we have penicillin. Well, I was on a uh, NOVA program one night, and I just mentioned this story, and I said, for me, that's very real. Penicillin made my life possible. It's very real for my children, because they would not be here, but my grandchildren, it's going to fade, and from then on, no one will ever know that. I got an email the next day from a researcher at NIH who said, I've worked my entire life on antibiotics, and when I heard you last night, I said to myself, I've never even thought of that, the second and third generations. He said, I was watching this with my father, and I said, did you hear that? 
He said, that's exactly right. And then the father told him for the first time his life had been saved in the Second World War because of penicillin. And the son, a researcher at NIH, had never even known that. So life's changed. I can tell you, if we were living with the medicine of 100 years ago, half of you would not be here. You would not be here because for a quarter of you, your parents would have died. The other quarter, you would have died. And so we take these things for granted, and maybe that's okay. I always say it's one of the benefits for being in public health. No one puts you on a pedestal, so you don't actually know what you have done, and so you're able to act more like a regular person, just as they can act more like a regular person and not think about it. And that's actually a nice way to live. Any, any questions? Uh, we have one here. Aggressively. <laughs> the uh, New York Times yesterday had an article where lawyers were saying that uh, the person who has driven this all the way to the Supreme Court has made a lot out of it, but that there's very little in law that makes you think this would be struck down. But, but no one knows that. So I don't know. But I do think that we have to collectively figure out how to redo the system. That it just does not make sense that the rest of the world seems to have figured out a better way to deliver health than we have. I mean, we've got all of this intelligence behind us of people that know how to run uh, corporations, that know how to do management, that know how to do everything. And somehow the greed... And that's what took us down the wrong road with tobacco. You know, with tobacco, there are two things that have allowed the tobacco problem. One is greed, and the other is addiction. And the marketplace has used both of those to their advantage. And I once told uh, an international anti-tobacco audience that we have to be very careful about blaming the people who smoke. I said, if you've not been addicted, you simply don't know what this is like. Addiction is for real. And I said, I'm one of the few people I've ever known who would actually smoke in the shower. And to smoke in the shower, you have to be very addicted and very tall. <laughs> but, but my bottom line here would be the marketplace... The marketplace simply hasn't worked to deliver health. It cannot, if, if we want equitable distribution, if we, if we want people to be able to all make use of what we know in medical science, ultimately we either have to redo what the marketplace pays for or we have to have a single payer system. Well, I'd like you to meet my grandson. <laughs> you know, this really requires a change in thinking. And technology has become so good that we tend to think of technological solutions. And, of course, technology comes up with solutions that we then have to use. But it really does take all of us. Uh, 
if you go to Chile and find out what they've done on poverty, they have not used high technology to try to improve the poverty situation. But President Lagos, when he was there, he did a full court press. And he said they could get 70% of poor people out of poverty. Now, if this is true, there, there are some answers there to how to mobilize society. And what they did was with each poor family, they did everything for a while. They helped them find a job or they helped train them so that they could get a job. They provided transportation for the children to school. They provided transportation for the parents to go for their training and for the job. They helped them to get housing and they kept helping them. And after a few years, they said 70% of those families came out of poverty. So this was a social solution, but it was using a lot of, of, uh, of technology. But it, it requires a different way of thinking that we truly do feel we're the keepers of our brothers and sisters, that we're not in this alone. And the greed which has infected Wall Street is something that we teach as being good in business school. And so we see this as a positive. Well, Gandhi said we should seek interdependence with the same zeal that we seek self-reliance. And then he added, because there is no other choice. We are interdependent. And that is part of what we should be teaching in school. We're all dependent on, on each other. Thank you for sharing your experience because it does require, number one, that we use our own experiences in order to do something, but then it requires, number two, using our imagination to what if we were in that situation. And we oftentimes take the position that this happens to other people and not to us. And I think that one of the differences between people who understand prevention and those that don't, I think people who understand prevention actually feel vulnerable. They can see themselves in that situation. And many people not in prevention, they don't, they don't feel they're vulnerable at all. They just go through life. And uh, so thanks for sharing that. Okay, that is a very good question, interesting question, and I'm not getting out of the answer by saying that it took us 170 years from the time we got smallpox vaccine until the time that we actually used it effectively. There is an incubation period for everything that we do. Obesity was recognized so late in the cycle that we don't have enough experience to be able to compare all the different approaches. I mean, yesterday uh, we hear in the news that uh, type 2 diabetes is better treated by surgery than by medical means. 
and uh, we're going to have a hundred of those kinds of obser observations before we realize what actually uh, works best. It's one of the areas where the pharmaceutical companies, of course, uh, are putting a lot of money because it's clear that uh, they will make a lot of money if they can figure out how to do this. And I must say, when I talk about addiction, this is one of the most difficult things to deal with. We all know that individually. I mean, we all are always sneaking up and then going back. Even when we're successful, it's just a challenge. And uh, for a long time, the way that I dealt with this was to get into bets with other people on who could lose the most weight in the next month. And it was that kind of competitiveness that kept us uh, losing weight. That's not a good long-term strategy, and, uh, and we know that. But, so I think we need a lot more experience to know exactly what to do. But I'm also very impressed with how people respond to benefits of various kinds. And it might not be a benefit of money if you lose weight, but there are some companies that are doing this. Seattle King County Health Department is actually providing increased salary for people that lose weight and keep it down, and it's working. So this is something... Uh, this is something worth looking at. But there might be other benefits that are even more uh, powerful. You know, I wonder, because of what we will do for our children, what if you could guarantee some educational points for children when their parents lose weight? They might do this for their children when they can't do it for themselves. So we have a long ways to go in exploring this, but I am confident that we're going to figure out an answer to this also. That's all the time we have for questions. I would like to thank Dr. Feige for being with us this morning. It's been a pleasure, and thank you for a great lecture. Dr. Rios. We wish uh, to present Dr. Foggy a certificate and a, a small token of our appreciation for an outstanding contribution to this forum and this opening session by being a speaker. I would like to call uh, the President, the Chancellor, and the Dean of, of the of the School of Public Health and Dr. Carrion Baral to come forward for an official photograph.